Hey guys, it's Brandon. Um, welcome to episode number two of the How to Ace Your Unseen Case video series. The complete video series where I take you from start to finish and run through absolutely everything that you guys need to know to ace your unseen cases at dental school. So I'm fresh from work today, still in my tunic, and today was good. Fitted some dentures, some fillings, um, did a root canal, and most importantly, saw a lot of new patients and did a lot of treatment planning. Which brings us to the topic of episode number two. We're going to be talking about the bulk of where you're going to get your marks. So your examination, and what to write down and what to note from the case study, your diagnosis, special investigations, and ultimately treatment planning. So I'm going to kind of leave the intro there. I don't want to be talking too long before the video because there's going to be a lot of information for us to get through. Um, I thought it'd be quite a good idea Every time there's a key point, I was thinking, well, how can I highlight this on the screen? And I was thinking, well, they're going to be little nuggets of knowledge. So every time you see this little chicken nugget icon floating about, that is something that is going to be essential to your learning that you need to understand or know inside out when it comes to your unseen cases. Um, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use cases and information I've picked up through foundation year. So they'll be on the screen as well, and I'll, I'll try and keep it as exciting and engaging as possible. I would suggest grabbing a tablet or, or a pen and paper, whatever you find useful for annotating, writing stuff down, because it is gonna be quite information intensive. Um, so I'm gonna do it all in one video, so please, if you need to, pause, reflect, come back to it, whatnot. Um, and yeah, that's it really. So without further ado, I think, I think we should get stuck in, sink our teeth into this one. Please support the video series. Um, I love enter education, but obviously your guys supporting me is gonna, gonna give me extra motivation to continue pushing these videos out. So all the usual things, um, please follow me on Instagram, which is at Tiller Talks Teeth. Subscribe to the YouTube channel where the bulk of the videos are gonna come out. And all engagement is, is appreciated. So likes, comments, shoot me DMs on Instagram. Um, I like to be interactive with the people that are watching. So yeah, let's get cracking. So I thought, why not start with our first little nugget of knowledge um, of the things that I can do. <clears throat> I remember when I was preparing for my unseen cases, I often felt quite overwhelmed with all the information that was on the screen. You have a set time limit to look over a case, try and pick out the key points, and then you know the examiner is going to be firing questions at you, and it can feel like a bit of a bit of a mess, especially if you don't really know how to articulate what you've seen on the screen down on a piece of paper here. So the first key thing that I think is, is a massive thing that helped me is I use two color pens. I would use a black pen to write down the bulk of the information, all of the things that I need to get down from start to finish. And then I would use a separate color, I think I use pink. And I would use this pen to highlight any key points or anything that I think is, is of relevance or importance in that case. So for example, if I'm writing down my history and I know on the on the case that a patient is taking warfarin for whatever reason, this is the kind of thing that I would highlight in pink. I would just put perhaps a little arrow next to it and I would just put SDCEP, anticoagulant guidelines, increased risk of bleeding. Because that is something that an examiner is likely gonna ask you, likely gonna focus on. And if they're saying to you, oh, is there anything in the medical history that you think is of important relevance? You can quickly glance down, pick out in pink, oh look, the patient's on warfarin, and you could, without wasting time, confidently relay that back to the examiner. So that was a huge help to me. Um, I don't know if anyone else did it like that, but I found that, that I often ended up with a lot of things on my paper here, and that was just a really good way for me to, to differentiate between key information and, and the bulk of information as well. So you can definitely give that a try. And I think following on from that, it's, it's important to be able to write down all of the information that you pick out in a, in a succinct manner on the sheet of paper in front of you. Because it's pointless scribbling down on an A4 blank sheet if you can't look down and quickly identify information or things that you need to remember when, someone's when someone is asking you a question. Because the exam is gonna be quite a high pressure and a high stressful situation. Your adrenaline's gonna be through the roof. You're gonna see so many things on the screen and you're gonna to think to yourself, shit, what do I need to pick out? 
Do I need to write every single bit of information down? How can I get all of this information down in, in the short amount of time I've got to look through it? And it can feel quite stressful and it can feel like a little bit of a mess to start with. So the way that I did it and the way that helped me so much is I essentially ordered or I essentially had nine headings that I memorized and I would go through those in my head as I'm reading the case and I would write down all of the key points under those headings so that every time I every time I looked at it I knew exactly where things were and exactly where a certain bit of information was and I think that if you can couple this with with practice 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 keep going through cases making cases up speaking to your friends about cases um, I'm going to be giving some some cases away at the end as well then it really helps and it eliminates the stress of having to think oh my god how am I going to pick things out and and write it down on the sheet of paper if you have it seamlessly it's going to save you a lot of hassle and a lot of time to ultimately put together a good plan in the short amount of time you've got so the first thing that I would always write is I would always start with the age and the gender of the patient and I would do this for two reasons. The first is because more often than not, an uh, examiner is going to ask you, can you give a brief description of the history? And it always sounds really nice to start with, we have a 14-year-old girl, or we have a 21-year-old male, or we have an 85-year-old male. One, because it starts the flow nicely, and two, because it shows that you're looking at more than just the, just the teeth or just the complaint that's in front of you. Because leading on to our second point, age and gender is so relevant in dentistry. Um, the age of a patient is important because your dentition is different at different ages. Your risk factors are different at different ages. Um, for example, in a patient who is a pediatric, a patient who is 4 or 10 or, or 14, they're going to have completely different dentition, which is relevant to so many different things. Or a patient who is 20 or a patient who is 80. The patient who is 80 is more likely to have different charting, not have as many of their teeth, more at risk of things like periodontal disease, more likely to have xerostomia, polypharmacy. There's a whole host of reasons why you need to be aware of the patient's age. And it's similar for the gender as well. There's differences between males and females. Females and males take different medications. Females have different hormones to males and ultimately the risk factors for certain conditions differ between males and females. So having an appreciation for both of those, starting with both of those at the top, adds to the flow and gives you a good overall insight of what you may be dealing with with the patient as well. So number two, and this is probably one of the important things, number two for me is always the, the presenting complaint. So the presenting complaint is one sentence which the patient has come in or, or, the, or see on your unseen case that the patient says in their own words. So I'd often write this in speech marks and it would be something like, I have pain on the top right hand side that's been going on for a couple of weeks. And that's it, that's your presenting complaint. You have no more information. It's just a broad statement that the patient comes in with and the information the patient gives you. That's point number two. Point number three follows on quite nicely from point number two and this is your history of presenting complaint. So this is where you gauge a little bit more information about the issue that the patient's having and you can start to formulate an idea of what's going on. So I'm sure we're all aware of the, the Socrates acronym for taking a pain history. And it's brilliant because it gives you good information on everything that's going on. And it's very easy to remember when you're going through it or when you're trying to pick out, a, um, pick out key information on an unseen case. So I would literally write the acronym Socrates underneath my presenting complaint and then next to it I can just annotate exactly which parts of, of Socrates that I can pick out and if there are parts that I can't pick out the blanks that I can see on the page if the examiner is to ask me well, what further information would you like I can look down and I can say well we haven't got an onset or we haven't got a time or a duration or things like that. So Socrates starts with the letter S and S stands for sight. So you want to be finding information on, is it left or right? Is it maxillary or mandibular? Is it anterior or posterior? It's as simple as that. Where is the pain in the mouth? Then you move on to O, which stands for onset. And onset is simply, when did the pain first start? Did it start today, yesterday, last week, last year? 
Um, when did you first notice it? And you can also get a little bit of information on if it's changed over time. So they could have first noticed it a year ago as a sharpness perhaps. However, now or last week they noticed that it come back as a spontaneous dull pain. All of this information can give you a little bit more of an insight as to what's going on. Um, so it's not information on how long it's going on for, but more when it was first noticed. C is the character of the pain, which is super important. As dentists, we have the privilege to be able to diagnose based purely on what people tell us. And a lot of the time it's from the character of the pain. So is it a sharpness? Is it a sensitivity? Is it a stabbing pain? Does it feel like a pressure? Is it dull? Is it a throbbing pain? Anything like this that will help you give a little bit of information perhaps on the status of the nerve or the periapical, um, periapical tissues as well. You might want to ask, does it hurt when you bite down or does it hurt when you release bite? And again, you could find out a little bit more information about if the pain has changed over time as well. R is radiation. So this is, does the pain travel anywhere else or is there anything else that's associated with it? For example, do you have pain in the lower jaw but think there might be pain in the upper jaw as well? Is there any associated lymphadenopathy, tenderness underneath the, underneath the jaw here? Any TMJ issues, any sinus involvement, any involvement with the eye, ears, or perhaps the patient's getting headaches. Anything where the pain may be causing something else in the head and neck region um, in particular as well. So A, A for me personally is alleviating factors. Some people use it as associated symptoms, but I tend to do that in my radiation. So for me, alleviating factors are anything that makes it better. For example, painkillers could make it better, so paracetamol or ibuprofen. Some patients could put a warm or a hot pack or a cold pack on the area, which will help with it. Sometimes it's better in the morning, uh, sometimes it's better at night time. Just try to gauge any extra information on things that make the pain better for the patient uh, generally. Moving on to T. This is where you get in this is where you're getting your information on how long the pain lasts when it comes on. So you want to look at this from two angles. You want to look at first of all, is it spontaneous or is it associated with a stimulus? And then you want to understand how long is it going on for? So is it a sharpness that is just associated with a symptom a stimulus that disappears straight away? Or is it something that perhaps can linger after a stimulus for seconds or minutes or hours or, or a dullness that's always there? Or is it a pain that comes on on its own and again lasts for seconds, minutes, hours, days? This is really crucial alongside character because you should be building a picture in your head now of perhaps the nerve is, is inflamed to some degree or perhaps there's some periapical pathology and the symptoms for these typically are quite classic, sharpness or dullness, spontaneous or with stimulus. And as soon as you can get these information, pick it off of the case presentation quite accurately, then you can start to consider your differentials. Which is nugget number two, which I was going to say afterwards, but I've kind of led on to it now. With your pink pen, when you're doing your pain history, this is the time where the brain, the cog should be ticking. And you should be thinking, okay, this patient's got these certain symptoms. I think this is what's going on. As soon as you start to think that, write your differentials next to your history of presenting complaint. If you think that the patient's got reversible pulpitis relating to a tooth, pop that down there. Because no doubt in my mind, one of the questions is going to be, what are the differentials for this case? And if you've already started to list them, you can save time. One, once you've written everything down and you're trying to think them, you've actually already got some. And two, if you don't get any time to write them down when you're, when you're going through the case presentation on the screen, then you can have some that you can quickly refer to and easily pick out on the paper. So I found that worked really well for me and I thought that was quite uh, a key point that I should share. But moving swiftly on, E for me is exacerbating factors. So anything that makes our pain worse as opposed to alleviating factors. So these can be your classics, your hot, cold, sweet, does it hurt when the patient is biting? Does it hurt when the patient is chewing? Same as biting. Um, does it hurt when the patient is asleep at night? Is it more painful then? Um, 
does it hurt when the patient is bending over? For example, if you have an irreversible pulpitis, sometimes pressure from tying your shoelaces or pressure from lying down can actually cause the the pain to be more intense. So anything that, that you think relevant or they think is relevant that makes things worse, jot down in your E. And finally, second S is for severity, which isn't the most important, but it's always good to throw in there. So severity typically for me, I would say, how painful is it now out of 10? With one being not very painful, 10 being excruciatingly painful, how painful is it now? And how painful has it been at its worst? It's as simple as that. And that's your Socrates acronym, and it's a really quick and really efficient way to do a pain history. If you learn it inside out, you can pick things off of the case in a matter of seconds and jot them down in no time and think, yep, I've got these, I understand them. Here are some differentials I've thought on. Let's move on, let's not waste any time on this. Very easy way to do it. There are a few other things that you can consider picking out from the history on the, um, on the unseen case. So for example, has the patient got any systemic symptoms? Are they fatigued or are they malaise? Anything that could suggest the spread of infection? Have they got limited mouth opening? or a swelling anywhere that's associated with it? Um, have they had a foul taste? Perhaps there's a draining sinus somewhere, or perhaps you're thinking about dry socket or um, pericoronitis, which is quite important as well. And does it keep the patient awake at night? Which is a huge implication in um, things like irreversible pulpitis. It's a huge giveaway factor there. So yeah, a few little extra things as well. So once you've nailed your presenting complaint and history of presenting complaint, you can start to pick other things out from the history now that are going to be relevant. And the next three headlines kind of follow on um, simultaneously from one another. So the first thing you're going to want to write down and pick out are what are your relevant medical history points. And you can split this into medications, medical conditions and allergies. Medications and medical conditions link quite nicely together. And whenever you're noting these, you should be with your pink pen, you should be thinking about anything that you think is relevant. So for example, if you have a patient who has asthma or diabetes or epilepsy, anything that can fall into the medical emergency category, immediately you should start thinking, well, is it stable? For example, is the asthma, sta asthma stable? Have they ever been hospitalized at all? When was the last time they had an asthma attack? Do they have a preventer inhaler? All of these things like that, that show that you're aware of more than just the condition. Um, if you have a patient who has epilepsy, you wanna be thinking about questions like, when was the last time they had an epileptic seizure? Is there anything that triggers an epileptic seizure? Or are there any telltale signs that the patient can let me know that may be preceding an, um, or prodromal to an epileptic seizure? For example, do they space out? Do they become dizzy? Do they become distant? Anything like that that shows you're beyond the level of just looking or just listing and repeating a, med a medical condition back to the examiners. And the same can be applied for medical conditions in relation to, and medication in relation to oral manifestations. So if you've got a medical condition, for example, let's talk about something that can present with ulcers in the mouth. So we've got um, anemia or Crohn's disease, things like that then you want to be thinking beyond the fact that the patient has just got this, very similar to your, to your medical emergencies. You want to be writing down in that pink pen, well, the patient's got this, perhaps I should be looking out for this in the mouth, or the patient is taking amlodipine, I should be aware that the patient might suffer from gingival hyperplasia. Or if there's a patient with polypharmacy, think, well, they're more likely to have xerostomia, they may be more susceptible to ulcerations, they may be immunocompromised, more susceptible to fungal infections. All of these things that show the examiner that you're thinking laterally and you're trying to preempt things and, and think ahead of the game. Are they taking bisphosphonates? Do they have osteoporosis so they may be taking bisphosphonates but the unseen case has left that one out? Why are bisphosphonates relevant? For Emronge. Are the patients taking any antiplatelets, any anticoagulants, anything that's going to make you consider taking extra precautions, for example, if you're doing extractions or high risk of bleeding procedures? Does the patient have an immunosuppressive disorder? Perhaps they're going to have um, delayed wound healing. Anything like this that you think 
goes above and beyond what is just on the paper is is going to get you a ton of marks. Um, so make sure you know your common medical medical conditions and medications outright. Um, another one, if the patient's got Lanzoprazole, then you know they're susceptible to reflux, more likely to have acid erosion. Just things like that. Just make a note of it briefly in your pink pen and you can look down and pick these things out. And if the things aren't given, so for example, if you have a, you have the information that a patient is asthmatic, but that's all you've got, then the examiner can ask you, well, what other bits of information do you need to know? And this is when you can start to say, well, I'd like to know, is it stable or unstable? Do they have a pump? When was the last time they had an asthma attack? And these are the questions that they, the simple things that they expect you to be able to pick out um, to get the bulk of those, bulk of those marks in your case. And allergies is the final thing. So in dentistry, relevance is a penicillin allergy is huge. A lot of the time in your foundation years and emergency treatment, you're going to be prescribing antibiotics. So you need to understand if a patient is tolerable of penicillins or not. A lot of dentistry can use latex. So you can have latex in the gloves and you can have latex in the rubber bungs. And a lot of people claim that they are sensitive or allergic to adrenaline as well, which is in a lot of the anesthetics we use. So allergies is a very important thing to note. And again, if it's not been noted in the unseen case, you need to try and gain that information when an examiner is asking you to talk through the medical history. Say, I don't have any information on the allergies. That's something that I would ask the patient before I conduct my exam. Just to show you them that you're thinking about it and that you're aware of it. And this ties in nicely with our next thing, point number, uh, point number five, which is our social history which is a little bit more information about what the patient does outside of their medical history. So you know, we want to be asking or finding information out on if the patient smokes. And it's not just enough to find out if they're a smoker or a non-smoker. If they're a smoker, we want to find out for how long have they been smoking, how many cigarettes per day, and try and work out the pack years. We want to work out if it is inhaled tobacco or chewing tobacco or if the patient is vaping. And we also want to know, has the patient ever tried to quit before or are they motivated to quit? Because as dentists and healthcare professionals, we've got a responsibility to give a patient very brief advice and smoking cessation advice if that's something that they're up to. So we need to find that one out. Similarly, we need to find out about their alcohol habits. So this includes how often they drink and also how much they drink so that we can work out their units per week. Um, with the understanding that for males and females, the maximum recommended amount of units per week is 14 units per week. But not only this, it's relevance in terms of their oral cancer risk. And also a lot of alcohol is quite acidic in terms of the potential erosive um, impact of alcohol on the mouth as well. You can also get information on the patient's recreational drug use if they do or don't. And... A really, really important thing to ask or find out about the patient is what is their occupation? And you're looking at this from the perspective of stress levels because stress is a major risk factor in oral health for periodontal disease. Um, if, they're, if they're stressed and busy, they may be less likely to attend. They may be more likely to be a nocturnal tooth grinder or have parafunction and clenching when they sleep, which puts them at a risk factor of um, dental sensitivity, tooth wear, uh, fractures and cracks, and TMJD as well. So finding out their occupation and if they lead a stressed lifestyle generally is a really important thing to remember when you're taking your social history. And I'm sure they're going to ask us about our past dental, our past, but the patient's past dental history as well, because at the end of the day, you're going to be qualifying as dentists. And these are things that we, these are the basics that we need to be understanding and picking out. So that's heading number six is picking out things about the past dental history, which include things like their attendance patterns. So are they a regular or irregular attender or do they only attend when they're in pain? You want to understand the patient's feelings towards the dentist. So are they dentally anxious? Are they dental phobic? Are they more, sorry, are they more likely to fail to attend based on this? Um, or are you going to have to manage their behavior in a different way as well? And then you want to go through the basics. You want to be working out their oral hygiene regime. So how often are they brushing? How long for? Are they using a fluoridated toothpaste? Are they spitting or rinsing afterwards? Are they cleaning between the teeth? So incidental brushes or floss? Are they using a mouthwash? 
Um, are you using an electric or a manual toothbrush? All of these relevant things that have been drilled into our brains since first year, they should slip off the tongue, um, but often they can be missed in an unseen case when you're trying to pick out the more complex stuff. So make sure you make a brief note of those things and understand exactly what you need to be knowing um, about their past dental history. And we're nearly there in terms of history, so we can breathe soon. Um, we've got the last few bits of information that we're going to want to pick out from the case and pop down in the paper in front of us. And the next thing, so we've done our whole history, the next thing is in relation to the clinical examination. Of course, you're not going to have a patient in front of you, but you're going to have information as if... Um, your examiner has seen a patient and charted it and written it all down for you. So you're going to be want to picking out heading seven, any extra oral features. So you're going to want to be learning about the TMJ. You're going to want to be picking out information on the lymph nodes and symmetry and muscles of mastication as well. Number eight following on is your intraoral. So you want to be finding out things about the soft tissues, lips, buccal and labial mucosa, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the hard and soft palate. Is there any potential pathology there? Um, does the gingiva look in good condition? Is there any areas of inflammation? Can you see that there's general inflammation? Is there any recession? And just making notes of things there. You could also make a brief chart here of potential areas of concern. So what I like to do is I used to like to draw um, a cross on my paper and I would write the teeth and if there's a caries or potential caries, I would just write the surface there. And it's super, super important. This is a little tangent, but this is a huge nugget of knowledge as well. It is super, super important. You're not going to be doing a clinical exam. So if you get radiographs or clinical photos and you are suspicious of caries, just say it. Even if it's the smallest little shadow or discoloration, you're not going to get penalized for the fact that it's not caries you'll get penalized for missing caries. If it's small, if it's large, they need to make sure that you understand what caries looks like and can pick it out and investigate it further. So if you're sitting on the fence with something and you're looking at a tooth and you're thinking, well, it could be caries, it couldn't be caries, just say in black and white to the examiner. If they ask you of any areas of concern, you say, the lower left six appears to have a distal occlusal shadow or staining of the fissure i can't accurately determine exactly if that is caries so i would do a thorough clinical examination when i saw the patient and i would take bite wing radiographs to determine if this is caries or not and the fact that you're addressing it ruling it out as something that could or couldn't be caries has shown that you've picked up on it if you potentially pick up on something but you don't mention it they're just going to assume you've missed it even if it's a gaping hole and you don't mention it they'll assume you've missed it. So say absolutely anything. I've forgotten where we were. So we've done extra oral, intra oral, um, and number nine. So this is the last thing is the best of the rest. So this is going to include noting things like your BPE scores, because there's going to be no doubt in my mind, you're going to get a perio question at some point. Um, and look for anything else or ask about anything else like a BWE exam, which is a, a basic erosion wear examination. Um, just things like that that you can quickly note down and may or may not be relevant to the case. And that's it. Breathe. You've had your minute and a half, two minutes to run through the case. You've got your game plan. You've got your nine points of things you need to pick out. You've clearly written them out on the page in front of you and you've clearly highlighted the important facts in pink. That's all you can do and get ready for the examiners to start giving you a grilling. So I think before we start section two, um, it would be a good idea for me to put an example on the screen shortly of the information that you'll be presented with in an examination, um, excluding, so everything up to the point of your charting. And I think it would be a good idea for you who's watching it to set yourself a time limit, perhaps somewhere between five and eight minutes, so you're not too rushed, um, but you've still got a time pressure. And set yourself an exercise to take a look at the screen and see if you can jot the key information down in a succinct and a clear manner. And then what I'll do after the pause is finished is I will run through a brief description of the case, picking out the key points, 
of how I would answer a question if an examiner was to ask me to give a, a brief description of the case that's in front of me. Um, so I'll pop that on the screen now and please feel free to pause it now and then I'll, I'll join you afterwards and probably going to grab a bowl of cereal quickly in the meantime um, to reset for the next section. So yeah, good luck. So I think that's a really beneficial exercise, um, just practicing. You can learn everything in the world on books and on paper, but if you can't you know, write it down effectively or communicate it effectively, ultimately it's going to waste you time uh, and it's going to put a lot of unnecessary pressure on yourself as well. So in the lead up to your vivas, make sure that every single case that you revise, you're doing that at the start to, to make it foolproof. So that'll just give you guys kind of a brief example of the things that you might come across in your case presentation. Um, typically, they'll include things like clinical photos, radiographs, and perhaps a hard tissue chart alongside these things. But it's just to give you a general idea of the kind of information that you might come across. So hopefully you guys found that all right. Hopefully you're able to get it written down in a nice, clear manner, well within the time limit that you set yourself. I think before I give you my brief description of the case, it would be a good idea for you to pause it and perhaps try and read it out yourself in 30 to 45 seconds perhaps. Listen to the way that I describe it and then try and adapt yours if you think that it needs to be sharpened up slightly. So if an examiner was to ask the question, give a brief description of the case, here's the kind of things that I would say when I'm giving the answer. I would say, we had a 75 year old female that presented at a routine checkup with pain on the lower right hand side and she also thinks she's got a hole in one of her teeth down there. It started around Christmas time, so a few weeks ago. It's a sensitivity to cold that doesn't radiate anywhere else in the mouth. She hasn't given us any information on any alleviating or exacerbating factors. It lasts typically for seconds after a cold stimulus and we don't have any information on the severity of the pain itself or any other associated symptoms. In terms of the medical history, the relevant history is the patient suffers from hypertension and takes amlodipine. She suffers from type 1 diabetes for which she takes insulin, suffers from asthma and takes a Ventolin inhaler as and when she needs it, and also suffers from hay fever. In terms of her social history, she's a non-smoker. She drinks less than 14 units of alcohol per week and she is retired, but we'd have no information on the stress levels that she's under. She's a regular dental attender every six months and has told us that she brushes twice a day. We don't have any information on the type of toothbrush she uses, how long she brushes for, if she uses a fluoride toothpaste or any incidental cleaning at all. In terms of the clinical examination, extra orally she had a click on the left hand side of TMJ. Intra orally the soft tissues were fine, there was no abnormality. And in terms of the hard tissues, a mesial occlusal caries was found on the lower right six, but we don't have any information on the depth into the dentine. And she presented on the BPEs with ones and twos generally as well. So that's kind of how I'd answer it. It flows quite well. You can get a lot of information out and you can also sneak in a few little bits of extra information. For example, on the past dental history, I kind of mentioned the fact that we didn't have any more information on how she's brushing or how long she's brushing for. Um, trying to essentially preempt a question that an examiner could ask me. So if that's the second question that they had on the page, you basically kill two birds with one stone. So give it another crack. Um, try it, see if there's any improvements that you need to, need to make, polish it, and then we'll crack on with the next section. And that information that you've got in front of you is going to lead nicely on to, to section number two of the Viva, which is going to be, they're going to ask you, can you accurately get some differential diagnosis, use these to lead yourself towards some special investigations, and ultimately come up with a definitive diagnosis that you can treatment plan from. Because writing down a definitive diagnosis is so key in dentistry. You may know that a tooth has reversible pulpitis, but if you're not to chart that, and if you're just to pick up a drill and do an amalgam filling, and someone else was to read the notes and they saw that you did a filling, if it's not written down, in sto um, not written down on paper, then it could be considered unnecessary. So reaching an effective, definitive diagnosis is, is essential. And it'll be a huge part of your Viva as well. So I think it'll be good to quickly talk about 
the different types of diagnosis that you're going to be getting and the special investigations that you can use to, to come to this diagnosis itself. So the first one that you might get asked that we briefly touched on already is can you provide some differential diagnoses? So differential diagnoses are ideas that you've picked up from the clinical history and the clinical examination only. So they precede radiographs and special investigations, but it's just an idea of the things that you're thinking about that you can use to dictate which special investigations you can do. So in terms of differential diagnosis, you can split them up into, into quite a few. Um, the first one that I always consider is a periodontal one. So you would typically do this from the information that you've got on the BPE. So if we're talking about a patient with ones and twos, then we're going to be looking at gingivitis. And the way I give my differential is I want to find out, is it localized? So less than 30% of the surfaces of the teeth or gums, or is it a generalized gingivitis? So if you've got a one in, in every sextant on your BPE, then it's going to be a generalized gingivitis. Um, but if you've got perhaps it just on the lower anteriors, then it's going to be a localized gingivitis. So that's your first differential for a perio, uh, for a periodontal diagnosis. However, if you've got threes and fours, then we are stepping into the clinical attachment loss zone and we're stepping towards periodontitis rather than gingivitis. And it gets a little bit sticky because obviously the new BSP classifications, you need a radiograph to determine the level of bone loss so that you can accurately stage and grade it um, and determine your stability and risk factors as well. So you might not have that information. And if you don't have the information on the screen, so you don't have a radiograph or you don't have a 6PPC, then the way I would present it is again, generalized or localized. So. For example, let's say we've got threes in every sexton. I would say this patient has, as a differential, generalized periodontitis. However, this, how I, this is how I would answer it. However, at the moment, according to the new BSP guidelines, we can't ascertain the stage or grade until we've got a radiograph to determine the most extensive site of bone loss. And that's how I'd answer the question. I would say that it would be appropriate to take full mouth PAs or an OBG to determine exactly where the greatest level of bone loss is. And in doing this, you can show the examiner that one, you've got a good differential, two, you understand the new guidelines, and three, you understand how you go from a differential to a definitive diagnosis based on these guidelines. So that's your perio differential covered. Then you've got to start looking at the teeth themselves. When we talk about differentials for teeth themselves, I like to split it into three main components. Um, I'll talk a lot more about this and in a lot more detail on the endodontic diagnosis, but I want to give a brief overview of the things that I do and the strategy that I use to explain my differentials to an examiner. So I look at the teeth from three separate parts. I look at it from what's above the gum line that I can see or observe clinically or radiographically. Then I give a pulpal diagnosis and then I give a periapical diagnosis. So, for example, the things that you can see above the gum line could be caries, um, it could be a fracture, it could be a deficient restoration, it could be um, tooth wear. And it's always good to give the site, so which part of the tooth, so is it distal, is it buccal, mesial occlusal, and it's always good to give um, the depth as well. So if we've got an enamel fracture or we've got a fracture into dentine, and specifically with caries, if you've got a radiograph, you can say, well, we've got upper left six with a distal occlusal lesion into the outer two thirds of dentine or into the inner third of dentine. Anything that if someone was to pick up this piece of paper that you've written down and described, they would be able to say exactly what's going on and understand exactly what you've seen inside the mouth. So if you've got a radiograph, brilliant. Always give the sight and always give the depth. But if you don't, then you would say I would take a bite wing or I would take PAs and I would try and understand the depth of the caries or the extent of the caries. You can comment if you have clinical photos, you can comment on the color as well because you can get a little bit of information from the color. So for example, if it is a light brown or a yellow lesion, you can quite confidently assume that it's probably active caries. 
Whereas if it's a really dark brown, then typically it's an arrested caries. Um, and you can say the same for tactility as well. So with your BPE probe, if you're feeling stickiness inside the lesion, then you can confidently say that it's active caries. But if it's a scratchy, firm or hard lesion, then you can confidently say that it's arrested caries as well. So that's also a good bit of information to include. Um, and then I give my pulpal diagnosis. So we're talking about dentine hypersensitivity, reversible pulpitis, symptomatic, apical, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis, or pulpal necrosis. That's the next thing you comment. The third thing is the periapical diagnosis. So I use the American Association of Endodontic Guidelines, um, and this describes symptomatic apical periodontitis, asymptomatic apical periodontitis, an acute apical abscess, or a chronic apical abscess. And if you put the three together, it gives a complete picture of the tooth. So for example, the tooth on the screen now is a, the tooth on the screen now is a lower left six. You can see that there's distal occlusal caries into the outer two thirds of dentine. Based on the clinical history we've got, the, actually I would also comment on the radiograph, perhaps I'd say, based on the PA here, you can see we've got distal occlusal caries into the outer two thirds of dentine. Based on the clinical history, we've got reversible pulpitis and there's normal apical tissue. And because they're differentials, you can, you're not wrong to say it could be dentine hypersensitivity as well because that also presents as a sharpness. However, if you're to, don't list absolutely everything because if the patient presents with these symptoms that are on the screen now and you say to someone, well, that's symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, even though it's a sharpness that doesn't linger longer than, ling, linger longer, even though it's a sharpness that doesn't linger longer than the stimulus is there, there's a real tongue twist there, then you know it's not symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. So only list the things that are relevant to the situation. Um, and a few other things that you're probably going to want to list on your differentials. Um, you might want to make a note of any tooth wear. Is it generalized or is it localized? Um, and into which surface? So something you might also consider as things that you can see on the soft tissue. So for example, this can be a white patch. Um, when it comes to diagnosing, giving differentials for a white patch, you won't know exactly what it is until you've got the histopathology. So you need to give sensible differentials, and I would say three, four, five differentials of things that it can be. And it's always a good idea to check the medical history or the clinical history again. See if you can get any clues, because you can have a list of about 20 differentials for a white patch. But... Trying to get it as accurate as possible based on the things you've seen is will really help you out. So, for example, if you've got a patient who you knows who you know that grinds at night, then they're more likely to have frictional keratosis. Or if you have a patient who is taking an inhaled corticosteroid and the, you've got a white patch on the tongue, then you know that it's likely to be a fungal infection or something like that. Any little clues that you can pick out that can help you write sensible differentials. So we've talked about our differentials and the basically the distinction between differentials and your definitive diagnosis, which is your black and white, this is what's going on diagnosis, is the fact that you use your special investigations and your radiographs in between to, to get to your definitive diagnosis. Um, and that's where you home in from the, the few ideas that you've got, right down to one specific diagnosis related to that, um, to that complaint or, or the things that you found. So where's the jigsaw piece in between? Now that is our special investigations and that is our radiograph. And you'll more than likely get asked what special investigations you should conduct why you should be doing them and what information they can help give you. So let's run through exactly, I'm sure you've come across many of them, use them on clinics, um, but perhaps for the younger dental students that might be watching, what special investigations we can use um, and why they're beneficial and why they're appropriate. So first special investigation that I would like to use that is quick and easy to do is the percussion test, which is essentially where you get your blunt end of your mirror and you tap horizontally on the teeth, so like this, and vertically on all the cusps as well. 
And this will give you two key pieces of information. The first one, and probably most importantly, in relation to most general cases, it will give you information on if it is painful or not when you're tapping on the tooth. So what I like to do is I like to tap on a sound tooth and then tell the patient, let's compare how that feels to the teeth that we're investigating. And I explain to them anything that is positive to, positive to percussion in pain-wise essentially means that there's inflammation of the periodontal ligament for one reason or another and pathology going on subgingival that perhaps we haven't seen super gingivally. So it won't give you information on the status of the pulp, um, but it will give you information on the status of the periodontal ligament and whether or not it's inflamed. Second thing that percussion will give you, and this is particularly related to, um, to trauma, is you can listen out for the sound. So, for example, if you have a pediatric patient with an intrusive luxation injury um, or a lateral luxation injury, if you're tapping on the teeth, as well as tenderness, you're looking out to see if you can hear for a, a metallic sound. And essentially, what that will indicate is ankylosis of the tooth and the root into the bone. So it'll give you a little bit more information of the restorability and the condition of that tooth. So an easy, quick, simple test that you can do. And I like to follow this up with a palpation exam where I will literally get my glove finger and I'll run it on the buccal gingiva and the lingual and palatal gingiva as well. And the things that I'm looking out for are lumps, bumps and swellings. Sometimes you can help to um, expose a sinus. And I'm also asking the patient if there's any tenderness that may be related to um, periapical pathology as well. So again, very simple, super straightforward and very easy to do. So TTP, palpation. Then we look at things like mobility. So mobility is good as an indication for, well, it's great in terms of restorability. If you're looking at a tooth um, and it's grade three mobile, immediately that you pretty much know that tooth is guaranteed to go into the bucket, ready for extraction. However, if you have a tooth that is only slightly mobile or has mobile fragments, then perhaps you're thinking that the tooth might be slightly more restorable. And mobility can also give you good information on the degree of bone loss if we're talking about periodont periodontally involved teeth. And you can also have a degree of mobility in teeth that have um, an acute apical abscess as well um, underneath the bone. So once we've done our mobility, something else that is nice and quick and easy to do is just an assessment of the pocketing around the tooth. So you're looking for any areas that's deeper than what's considered healthy, which is three millimeters. And if you find a pocket, it could be for one of multiple reasons. The most common reason is that it's gonna be a periodontal pocket in relation to periodontal disease. And typically you'll find that the pocket will be at multiple sites around the teeth in a patient with poor oral hygiene and a patient that has periodontitis elsewhere in the mouth. However, if you find a single narrow isolated pocket in relation to in a patient that has good oral hygiene and no periodontal disease elsewhere it's often associated with a crack or a fracture that might have run subgingival and the inflammation's caused um, localized bone loss particularly to that area so pocketing is another really good um, tool You've got other really simple ones that you can use, like a tooth sleuth for trying to find a fracture or a crack cusp. You can use articulating paper if you suspect that there's parafunction or a high point in the occlusion. That can help to highlight that. You can um, do a color observation. You can do an oral hygiene, so plaque and bleeding tools is a good special investigation. 6PPC falls under a special investigation. Um, your BWE again, which is your basic erosive wear exam. That falls under a special investigation and study casts as well fall under um, special investigations. But the one big one that we've left out that I wanted to talk about at the end that you're probably thinking, why has he not discussed this one already? Is sensibility testing. And sensibility testing, nugget time, sensibility testing is not interchangeable with the term vitality testing. So if you say to an examiner, I would like to vitality test the tooth, more often than not, they're gonna penalize you because putting something cold or hot on the tooth is not, it will not determine the status of the pulp 
in terms of from a necrotic point of view. Pulpal necrosis is a diagnosis that you need histopathology. You can't determine the blood flow to a tooth based purely on response to hot or cold. So always stick to sensibility testing as your wording and just chuck vitality testing out of your brain, out of the window, get it out of there straight away. Because it's a silly mistake that people can, can trip up on quite easily. And there's a few different types of sensibility testing that we need to understand. So the most common in the first one is your cold test. So what this does is it stimulates a delta fibers in the pulp that can elicit a painful or a sharp response. Now you've got a few options and more often than not people will have heard of ethyl chloride and endofrost and similarly to sensibility and vitality these two terms aren't interchangeable. Ethyl chloride typically goes to I think around minus 12 degrees whereas endofrost goes all the way down to about minus 45-50 degrees. So I typically use endofrost as my cold test because you're more likely to get a response and with ethyl chloride because it's not as cold in perhaps a pulp that is on its way out you might not elicit a response as opposed to if you're using endofrost so I just think endofrost as a whole is slightly more reliable more accurate and again similarly to percussion what I'll do with endofrost is I'll put my endofrost cotton pellet on a sound tooth and I'll say to the patient you should feel cold when I take the cold pellet off the sensation of cold should disappear immediately and then I would put it on the teeth we're investigating and I'll say please compare the response if there is a response to the tooth that I've just done it on and more often than not the tooth will be hyperemic so no, not hyperemic hyperalgesic so it will be a more intense sharpness that may disappear straight away to indicate that we've got a reversible pulpitis or a hypersensitivity. Or if it's cold, it might linger for a long time to suggest that perhaps the nerve is irreversibly inflamed and we've got an irreversible pulpitis going on. You'll typically get a non-responsive tooth in something where it now has an apical pathology. So the pulp is leaning towards a necrotic state or is already at a necrotic state. But like I said before, you can't use just the cold test to conclude that you've got pulpal necrosis. Um, heated GP as a hot test is something you can do, um, something to be aware of. Not as common as using a cold test. I don't think I've ever used a heated GP. Um, one, because it can damage the tissues, and two, it's not readily available chair side in my practice. Um, and the third one is an EPT or an electric pulp test where you run a current through the tooth and elicit a painful response and you compare the current of a sound tooth and that response to the current in a tooth that you're investigating. So it's a great way to determine the status that the pulp is in in terms of um, if it's inflamed or not won't give you any real information or won't give you any information on the periapical tissues um, but it's a great quick test to determine if you think basically to confirm what the patient is saying in terms of their symptoms and kind of confirm exactly which tooth that you need to be investigating and the tooth that you're looking for a diagnosis from and those are the ones I use really um, if I have a patient that comes in in pain or with an issue or a complaint I will typically do all of those for a tooth just to get as much information as I can and it takes a couple of minutes and all of this will lead me towards my definitive diagnosis because you've got information on the things you can see clinically you've been given information on the state of the pulp and you'll have been given some information on the state of the periapical tissue that you can marry up with a radiograph and radiographs are such a good tool to help you diagnose Unfortunately, we don't have x-ray vision at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's a really annoying thing that patients say every single time they come in with a mask on is, do you need me to take this off now? You probably can't see in the mouth when I've got the mask on, to which I reply, I haven't developed my x-ray vision yet. And I probably say that about seven or eight times a day. It is mind-numbing sometimes. Um, but the patients love it. So x-rays are brilliant for investigating for a lot of things. And... You want to be hot on which x-rays to take and when to take them, So and why you take them. 
So the FGDP guidelines are really good for read up on those. For this, I think it's called the selection criteria for dental radiography, um, and it gives you basically it gives you a guideline of what X-rays to take and why you would take them and when you would take them. So if we're to run through them briefly, we a simple one that we can use are our bite wings, and these give us information on the crowns of the upper and lower teeth and some information on the coronal part of the root as well. So typically you'd use bite wings in the investigation of caries depth. You would use them to investigate for, sometimes to investigate for bone levels. You'd use them to investigate for any overhangs or plaque retentive factors such as um, subgingival calculus. Um, you wouldn't typically use them for periapical pathology because you won't be catching the apices of the roots. And there's something that commonly you use at a new patient exam or if you're suspicious of carious lesions um, and which sites they're at. So very quick, very easy, very accurate and give you a very good insight specifically when we're looking for caries. Like I said, they don't give you any information on your periapical region. So when you're considering taking a PA, this is typically when you're investigating for periapical pathology. So if you suspect that there's perhaps your tooth is TTP and you want to confirm if there's anything going on subgingivally, or you want to build a complete picture of the tooth, then that is when you would take your periapical. It gives you information on the crown, the full root, and in a gold standard PA, three millimeters, at least three millimeters of bone beyond the apex of the root. So you get information on the bone as well. They're really good for seeing complete bone levels, um, helping to assess restorability, and also visualizing root morphology and canal morphology if you're considering, one, if you're considering endo restorability, and two, if you're considering extractions as well. So brilliant for that. The third, I would say the third most common one that people typically use are your OPGs. OPGs are good because you can visualize structures that perhaps you can't visualize on bite wings or PAs. For example, it's very difficult to capture the ID canal on a PA because it's so far, so hard to get it so far in the back of the mouth. So if you have a, a lower wisdom tooth with pathology and you want to check for a close relationship of the ID canal to a lower wisdom tooth if you're thinking about taking it out, then a sectional OPG, if it's one side, or a full OPG is, is a perfect x-ray for that. It's also a brilliant x-ray for developing dentition because you can see the teeth within the jaw and you can also see the teeth that have erupted. It's good for a patient that may have mandibular pathology, a patient that may have TMJD because you can visualize the condyles. Um, and it's good for a patient that has a strong gag reflex as well. So if an examiner is to ask you, what's an alternative to a patient that has a strong gag reflex, you would consider an extra oral, exam um, an extra oral radiograph such as an OPG. Um, things it's not so great for is anterior teeth because typically they can be out of the focus um, because of the nature of an OPG. Sometimes it's hard to visualize caries accurately. Um, if you have, because you have overlapping of the images and superimposition of the images, it can be hard to accurately determine if you've got caries or not. And it's also obviously it can't be used for endo because you can't accurately measure the length of the roots and the morphology of that. But overall, a brilliant piece of, um, brilliant x-ray to use as well. And I could talk about x-rays for days, um, but I think I'll probably do a, a video on an x-ray and probably do a video on how to give a succinct radiographic report at some point. Um, so yeah, please read the FGDP guidelines, selection criteria for dental radiography and get that in your head. And then we'll practice doing radiographs in another video in the, in the coming future as well, because that's a key part of the, of the Viva. Okay, we're, we're almost there. We are now section number three. So we've got all the information in section one from the case that's in front of us and we've presented it in a really clear, succinct manner. Section number two, we've taken all the information that we've gained and gathered, got our differential diagnosis, conducted really nice special investigations and arrived at a definitive diagnosis. 
And section three is taking our definitive diagnosis and creating a treatment plan that will be effective and realistic for a patient because that's the end goal, okay? We're gonna look at this from a perspective of first of all prognosis and then run through treatment planning itself. So prognosis is, is super important when you're talking about treatment planning because like I said, you have to be realistic and it's really important to manage a patient's expectations and understanding the prognosis of a tooth goes a long way to doing this. Um, and you can save yourself a lot of time and hassle as well. For example, if you have a tooth with a hopeless prognosis, 100% bone loss, you're not gonna give a patient unrealistic expectations and options that that can be restored. You're gonna tell them that you recommend that that tooth is extracted and is chucked straight in the bin. So I like to look at my prognosis from a perspective of three areas, which seems to be a key of everything I look at. Um, and the three areas essentially are, I look at it from a tooth tissue perspective. So is, it, is there enough tooth tissue to support a restoration? I look at it from a periodontal aspect, so is there enough periodontal support to, for the tooth to still be functional in the mouth? And I look at it from an endodontic or an apical um, perspective as well, in terms of infection, root morphology, and et cetera, and things like that. So there's a really good um, index that I'll flash up somewhere on the screen that gives really good in-depth detail of the things that I'm about to summarize shortly. Um, and it's the Darwood et al. Dental Practicality Index. So I definitely suggest you guys have a look at that. Um, I think it scores things from naught to six, but it basically talks in a little bit more depth about the three areas that I like to focus on. Um, with the first one being tooth tissue. So we could look at a tooth and we could think that the roots are great and we could do a smashing endo on that and a really good RCT. But at the end of the day, if you don't have enough tooth tissue to support a restoration, it's going to fail um, because you don't have a correct coronal seal. So when you're looking at tooth restorability from a tissue perspective, there's a few factors you want to be considering. Is there enough tooth to support a restoration? Do we have enough walls present? Where are our margins? Are they supra or subgingival? If we're talking about cracks, do we have um, supra or subgingival crack as well? Where is the decay or the cavity? Is it what portion of the dentine is it into? Is it already into the pulp? Um, and if we're looking at things like crowns and other indirect restorations, we need to consider if there's a sufficient for all to even support a restoration. So it's quite multifactorial, um, but you need to address all of these aspects specific to what you're gonna be doing. Um, because like I said, if you can't restore the tooth, there's no point doing all the other stuff on it in the first place. So the second thing I look at is the periodontal support. And we're looking at this from a perspective of bone levels, uh, pocket depth and mobility. And it's very common to have a patient that comes in with um, a tooth that perhaps has fractured or has caries that needs restoring, um, but it's grade three mobile. And you have to consider, well, is it worth your time, their time and money and effort to actually restore this teeth? And an analogy that I quite often use with my patients and I, you know, I build rapport and I put, I put it in the nicest way possible is I say to them, you're looking to decorate a house that's built on sand. If you don't have the foundations, then anything that you do above the gum line is, is most likely gonna fail. And that tooth's gonna to probably have to come out at some point. So it's really important to consider how mobile a tooth is. If you have pockets of you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, you're looking at a questionable prognosis of the tooth. Um, and if you have 100% bone loss or, or significant amounts of bone loss, then you're heading that way as well. So always consider the periodontal support so last but not least, I consider the endodontic or apical tissue. Um, and this is probably more appropriate if you're thinking about doing endodontics on the tooth. Um, and you want to be looking at things like, well, what's the size of your PA pathology? How big is the swelling? Is there a presence of a sinus? Kind of what's the extent of the infection in terms of how successful that root canal is going to be? But you need to look beyond those things as well and you need to be considering, well, what's the root morphology like? If you have 
a root that is bent at a 90 degree angle, what's the likelihood that you're going to actually be able to get an apical, good apical seal? You need to consider, um, similarly to that, you need to consider, well, what's the status of the canals like? Have you got an older patient with a heavily sclerosed canal? And what's the, the realistic chance that you're going to be able to get a tiny little file down that sclerosed canal? Is it actually acceptable to try and do an RCT on that tooth? And you also want to consider, well, has it been root canal treated before? Am I going to be able or is it appropriate to try and root canal treat it again? So a lot of factors to take into consideration. Um, and you can kind of build a picture of the tooth by using these three, um, these three things to assess and then come to an overall decision on your restorability. And I typically categorize my restorability into a tooth having good prognosis, a tooth having questionable, progno questionable prognosis, a tooth having guarded prognosis where you're unsure it could, it could go either way, it could fail or it could um, go back to what's considered healthy or a tooth that has hopeless prognosis or poor prognosis. Um, so that's kind of how I do it. And I do it for every single tooth in the mouth. I color code it. Um, so if I've got a picture or an x-ray and I'll color code it and I'll write it down. And that's a good way to approach things before you start treatment planning. Other things that you can consider when you're talking about prognosis are oral hygiene, parafunction, the cooperation of the patient and also the age of the patient as well in any polypharmacy. All really valid points when you're thinking about it and points to consider during your unseen cases as well. And that's it. You got to the end. You've gathered every single bit of information previously and it's landed you at this one last jigsaw piece, which is treatment planning, which typically is quite straightforward. Um, everybody follows the same template which is you split your treatment planning into four categories. The four categories being the emergency phase, the prevention and stabilization phase, rehabilitation phase or restorative phase, and finally your maintenance and your recall phase. So let's briefly run through the things that you can expect um, in each of the phases. So starting with the emergency phase, these are the things that you feel that need to be addressed immediately um, or acutely. So for example, if the patient is in pain or if the patient presents with uh, a swelling or a limited mouth opening, something like that. Things that need to be addressed here and now essentially. And you briefly, your options for pain relief typically are antibiotics. So these are indicated only in cases where you have a swelling if you have limited mouth opening or if you have evidence of a spread of infection, which can include lymphadenopathy, so tenderness or swelling under here, or systemic signs of systemic infection, for example, if the patient has fever or fatigue that you can't really attribute to anything else. Those are your main indications for antibiotics. Things that people commonly mistake the need for antibiotics for, which could trip you up, um, include if a patient has a draining sinus, there's no justification for antibiotics purely because the infection has a means of um, escaping the area that it's in. If a patient has dry socket without any of the, the aforementioned symptoms, then antibiotics aren't justified. Or if the patient, or if the patient just presents in pain. So if the patient has a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, you don't prescribe antibiotics unless you have one of the, the symptoms we mentioned previously. Other options for pain relief that you can do in practice, um, you can consider extirpating the nerves. You can consider extracting the tooth if you have, have the time to do that. You can give an analgesic protocol, warm salt water rinses. You can do dry socket management if the patient has dry socket. Irrigation of pericoronitis and addressing that. You can provide the patient with the TMJ instructions. Anything that you think is beneficial or helpful for the complaint that they've presented in, basically. And fluoride varnish is also brilliant. Um, great for sensitivity. And even just for the placebo effect, you tell a patient that you're going to spread this magical varnish on. More often than not, it provides some level of, some level of pain relief. So once we've addressed the pain, next thing we need to do is prevention and stabilization. This comes before restorative because 
all of the restorative work you're going to do. If you're doing that in an unstable mouth, for example, with poor oral hygiene, perio, parafunction, the likelihood of that succeeding compared to a patient that has been adequately stabilized is a lot less. So prevention and stabilization is super important to get down to a T before you start doing your restorative work. And the best thing that you can do in terms of learning prevention protocol, particularly for your exam, know this like the back of your hand, is to read the Delivering Better Oral Health toolkit. Um, and it basically just gives you really good oral hygiene instruction and diet advice. It'll give you information on gold standard brushing, fluoride protocol, so we're talking about concentrations of fluoride in toothpaste, concentrations of fluoride in Durafat and when to give that, concentrations of fluoride in fluoride varnish, how often and when to give that as well, and other things like when to use a fluoride mouthwash, and general information like when to stop baby bottle feeding, when to start using, start brushing teeth, and, and all things like that. So really, really, really important to, to get that down to a T. No doubt they'll be asking you something on prevention along the lines of that as well, especially in your paediatric case. Following on from that, your prevention protocol can include, this is where you'll include your periodontal therapy. So we're talking about plaque and bleeding. We're talking about our six PPCs. We're talking about our super and sub gingival PMPR according to the new guidelines. So professional mechanical plaque removal um, and everything related to the gums. And prevention can also include things like prescribing a night guard, for example, if someone has nocturnal grinding and TMJ management as well. So prevention done, we now move on to our restorative phase. And this is basically where you rebuild the dentition. So we're talking about things like direct and indirect restorations. We're talking about dentures, denture work in this. We're talking about all of our endodontic work, anything that restores the teeth back to what is considered normal and what is considered healthy, all falls in your restorative phase. Fairly straightforward. And then once everything's done, you want to be looking at recall. And recall is basically the intervals that you get a patient back for review and the intervals that you take your radiographs at. So this includes things like periodontal review. So if you do periodontal therapy, you want to be looking at getting a patient back in after six to eight weeks to review the 6PPC and the healing. If you do endodontics, then you want to be looking at reviewing the RCT after a year, radiographically and clinically. If you have a patient who's undergone trauma, there'll be specific trauma recall intervals as well, which we'll, we'll discuss in another video. And then you've got your general routine recall and routine radiographs. So routine recall typically is a nice guideline and it depends on the risk of that a patient is for caries. So I'll flash it up on the screen now, and it differs for pediatrics and adult patients, and it's done on high, low, and medium caries risk. And it's similar for radiographic bite wing intervals as well, um, which is an FDGP guideline. And again, pediatric and adult, and high, low, or medium risk. So know these two off the back of your hand as well. They're super, super important when you're determining what your recall is and should be done for every single patient. And that's it. That's your start to finish from getting a case presentation and running the whole way through what the structure of the things that you need to pick out is gonna be. Um, you can probably tell my voice is starting to die a little bit. I've been talking for three and a half hours for about 45 minutes worth of content. <laughs> I do have a couple of things left on my tablet that I think are good tips and tricks to bump you up to the top level. So I'll quickly run through those. Um, the first one is related to treatment planning and informed consent, which is really, really important when you're treatment planning every patient. So it's basically to obtain informed consent, you need to give the patient every single realistic option. And by realistic, it is what most dentists would do. When you're giving your options, no treatment and monitor always has to be an option. Even if you think it's against your clinical judgment, you have to understand that the patient has a right to make an unwise decision and the right to their own autonomy when it comes to treatment planning um, and making decisions. When you're giving your consent, 
and your options, you have to explain in full the risks, the benefits, and also the costs of the procedure as well. And I think it's a good time for you guys to start to learn to understand the costings of the NHS, so how the banding system works and how patients get charged, because um, it's so relevant to treatment planning. You can offer a person cuspal coverage, which you think is a gold standard, but they might not be willing to fork out £282 on a treatment plan, so they might choose something that you consider suboptimal. Um, and that's it. And just remember that decisions in dentistry are between yourself and the patient. Long gone are the days where you tell a patient what is right and wrong and what the patient should be doing. They have a right to this unwise decision. Um, and at the end of the day, it's their mouth, not yours. As a clinician, you're there to investigate and you're there to, you know, tell them your findings, provide them with all the information and help them make a decision. And that's it. I hope it was helpful. I hope there are still some people watching till the end. Um, obviously, I know it was quite long-winded and I tried to make it as relevant as possible. And when I edit it down, I'll try to make it as easy to understand and as easy to follow as possible. Um, and that's it, really. Like I said at the start, your support will be so, so appreciated. So if you could like this video, Leave a comment, even if it's a silly comment. Any engagement that I have is really, really, really good for the channel um, to help it grow and help more people see it. Please tag people on Instagram, tag people on YouTube um, and share the video. I think we're going to address adult restorative next time. So we might talk about start talking through cases. So perhaps direct and indirect and direct and indirect restorations or perhaps endo and perio, or, or surgery, I haven't really decided yet. But we'll go with the flow, um, and we'll go from there. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.